work of the kingdom. I think I have to say, uh, what a week. Uh, whether you're talking about the weather or the national election or Notre Dame, it, there's been a lot going on this week. So <laughs> uh, thank you for those of you who uh, uh, gave me your blessing as I was on retreat up in Michigan and for a couple days this week. Uh, I went up on Tuesday afternoon and realized that I didn't have internet and my phone was really intermittent and I was not gonna know who was elected president of the United States until I came back on Thursday. <laughs> so, so anyway, it was a good retreat. Um, I have come over to the other side today. Uh, those of you who are in your cars, I'd like you to uh, join me in welcoming Jean Hollenberg. You wanna honk? to say welcome to Jean. Here you are. Uh, I'm joined here on the chancel by Jean Hollenberg, who many of you know as the director at Camp Alexander Mack. Uh, he's had other roles for, uh, in the district and in his congregation as well. Uh, Jean was a middle school English teacher. He was an administrator in South Bend schools. He has been a member of the district board and chaired the, the district board of the Northern Indiana District. And in 2018, he was the district moderator of uh, the Northern Indiana District. So I think all of that means that he'll be able to handle our meeting here today pretty well. So we are delighted that Gene is our new uh, moderator here at Creekside. Uh, we thank him for coming on uh, under unusual circumstances. Um, I'll give you more directions about that meeting after the service here, uh, but Jean will be sharing during the service. We will have a shortened service today so that we can move into that, uh, into that business meeting immediately afterward. I'd invite us now to enter into a time of worship. I have a call to worship to share with you. Where there is no justice, there is no acceptable worship to God. God is not interested in a full church and empty promises. If we don't commit to righteousness, God does not want our praises and prayers. As we come to worship this morning, we are challenged to consider what we can expect from God and what the Lord requires of us. I'd invite you to join me as you listen to this opening prayer. We come before you now with some degree of fear and trembling because we are an imperfect embodiment of the people whom you have called us to be. Remind us that we are called to be the body of Christ, a reflection of your namesake. Encourage us to invest our faith in the pursuit of what matters to you so that the waters of justice and mercy would flood our nation and our world. Amen. Well, good morning, boys and girls. Good morning. Today I'm going to be talking to you about pleasing God. Now, what does that really mean? Well, let's see, if you wanted to have an ice cream cone, let's say, or if uh, your name was Roger Griffith and you wanted a cookie and someone was nice enough to give that to you, then Roger would be very pleased. So that's what it means to please God. You're giving him what he wants. You're doing what he wants you to do. So I'm going to tell you a little story about a mouse named Jerry. Uh, Jerry lived in a great big huge house. I mean it was higher than the ceiling. It was huge. You had to go up so many stairs it'd wear you out. Well lucky for Jerry he lived on the bottom floor. All the other mice, all of his relatives, they lived upstairs. Jerry was really fortunate because not only did he live on the bottom floor, but just down the hallway from where he lived in that hole in the wall, was the dining room. Now every night, the owner of that dining room 
would have cheese for a snack. So Jerry found out about that. Every night at midnight, he'd go down there and he would find crumbs that that sloppy eater left underneath the table. And he'd pick those crumbs up and he'd stuff them in his mouth, stuff them in his mouth, mm, so big, and then he would scurry back to his hole in the wall. And there in the hole, he had this great, big, huge piece of plastic wrap. So he'd open up the plastic wrap, take out the cheese, put it in the plastic wrap, take out one little binky piece, and eat it. Close up the plastic wrap, he's all done, he's happy, and he'd sit back and he would admire his great, big, huge amount of cheese in the plastic wrap. Well, one night, he was pondering what time it might be, and about that time, he hears a pitter-patter. And he looks out from the hole in his wall, and there goes another great, big, huge mouse into another hole on the other side of the hallway. And he's like, what the heck is going on? Oh, what to do, what to do? Looks over at his cheese, and he goes, oh, I'm going to... I'm going to lose all my cheese. That big old mouse is going to go down there, find a dining room table. It's going to take my cheese, my cheese, my private property. I don't know what to do. I know. That's it. I'll just go over and I'll tell that big old mouse that that's my private property and that mouse is not allowed to go down there to my private property. And that's it. I'll do it in the morning. So first thing in the morning... Good old Jerry gets up, pitter-patters over to the door, knocks on the hole in the wall, and Ms. Mouse comes to the door. She says, oh, why, hello, neighbor, come on in. He comes in, and she picks up this crumb of bread. And she says, this is, this is the last, last crumb of bread that I have, but I'd like to have it for you, my neighbor. And he looks at that crumb of cheese, and he looks past the crumb of cheese, and right over there are 10, 10 count them, 10 baby mice. She just had 10 baby mice that night. Holy moly, what am I going to do? Now, boys and girls, I'm going to have to interrupt this story because I'm the storyteller, and i got to tell you what's going to happen because I just can't hold back. I'm sorry. He's going to get red in the face. He's going to get so angry because all these mice are here, and now he's going to have to find someplace else to go. So he's going to run across through the hallway. He's going to look at his mound of cheese and think, oh my goodness, what am I going to do? And he's going to stuff his mouth and he's going to go down to the dining room and find another hole and he's going to be there where he can get the cheese every morning so nobody can get it. He'll show them. Yeah, that's what he's going to do. Well, I'm sorry I spoiled the story, daggone it. But anyway, so she offers him the, the crumb of bread. He refuses it. His face turns beet red. I told you. He runs across the hallway. He goes into his hallway door, and in there, he sees his cheese. He starts picking up the cheese, stuff in his mouth. Okay, I told you. He runs out of the, the hole in the wall, and he starts down the, the, across, the, across the hallway. What the? Across the hallway to Miss Mouse's hole in the wall. Knocks on the wall. She comes to the door. He goes in, and he gives her all the cheese. No, that didn't turn out quite like I thought it would be. Well, anyway, so Miss Mouse was so thrilled and so happy, and he felt so good, and I'm sure the great creator felt pleased to see that happening, and she was just so thrilled, and if COVID wasn't around, she'd be hugging him right now, I'm sure. And he, 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 he just felt so good about it that every night, he would go down and get cheese, and you know what he'd do? He'd take it over to her, and then he'd go to his bag, and he'd get some more and take that over to her, too, every night for the rest of his life. So, you know, that's, that's the story about Jerry. And, you know, if we could be like Jerry at the end of that story, not like the one I thought it would be, but if we could be like that, wouldn't that be great if we could just share the many blessings that we have? Well, let's have a prayer. Our Father, we come to you just now to thank you for the many blessings that we have. And may we always be willing to share those blessings with those in need.
Amen. Our scripture reading today is from the fifth chapter of Amos. I'll be reading from the contemporary English version. Um, I had a seminary professor who had uh, this passage cited on his office door uh, along with the saying, I will not accept your bull. So uh, you can see if you can hear that as uh, part of this passage today. I'll begin in verse 18. You look forward to the day when the Lord comes to judge, but you are in trouble. It won't be a time of sunshine, all will be darkness. You will run from a lion only to meet a bear. You will escape your house and rest your head on the wall and be bitten by a snake. The day when the Lord judges will be dark, very dark, without a ray of light. I, the Lord, hate and despise your religious celebrations and your times of worship. I won't accept your offerings or animal sacrifices, not even your very best. No more of your noisy songs. I won't listen when you play your harps, but let justice and fairness flow like a river that never runs dry. The word of the Lord. I am so glad to be here today, and it's good to see so many friends. Um, I have a couple things to say really quickly about uh, my role as the executive director at Camp Mac, and then I'm gonna go into um, doing what I'm really here for. Um, I, I can't be here without thanking this congregation for the ways that you have supported us and worked with us during this really, really difficult time. Um, it's been um, such a blessing to see so many folks who contribute and, and just stop by, and, and I know that you um, have kept us in your prayers, and we are just, we're just thrilled with the kind of, of support that you've shown. Um, especially, we have um, um, thanks to the folks who've been helping with the prayer garden. Um, that's been a wonderful, wonderful experience, and I know you have people here who are telling you all about it. Uh, we want to thank you for your work with, um, with Kristen and um, the work that she's doing with the homeschool groups. It's all been um, especially important this year, so thank you. We want to... I can't go without thanking you for that. So, did you have the same reaction I did to the um, video of Oh Healing River? I mean, wasn't that awesome? I mean, that was just an awesome arrangement. I, I picked that one in particular because um, I sing in the choir at Union Center whenever I can be there, and of course we haven't had choir for a long time, but um, I sing there whenever I can, and that's one of the anthems that we've done, that particular arrangement. And, and it's, so it's hard for me to sit there and look at the, the music and not just want to you know, join the tenor part there. But that's an awesome, awesome song, and it's so important for us today. O healing river, wash the blood from the sand. I mean, isn't that kind of the way we feel? Can't we get some, something that's going to come and wash away all of this discord and all of the difficulty and all of the, the problems that we have right now and, and take us back to where we need to be. I mean, that, that's what that song kind of engenders in us, is that, that idea of, of wanting to be healed, wanting it to just be over. Well, when Amos was talking with the leaders of Israel in this passage, he was saying, you know what? You don't want what you think you want. You think you want God to come and judge because you think that you've been really good during this time period. But you're in for a surprise. You think that you're going to be running from the lion and then you meet a bear. So then 
you're running a different way, and when you get home, you put your hand on the wall, and you take a deep breath, and there's a snake there that bites you. That's the image that he creates in here. The image is that we cannot get away from the difficulties of life that are around us. We can't be looking for this thing down the road that's going to come and save us. We can't be expecting that to happen. The day of the Lord, in Amos's um, statement here, the day of the Lord is all about judgment. It's all about a day of reckoning. That's what it meant in this, this time in um, Israel. We think of the day of the Lord as that time when Jesus comes again. But Revelation tells us Jesus has already come, that, that the second coming has happened. We are part of it. We live it every day. And now it's our job to help make sure that somewhere down the line, that vision that God has given us of what it can be happens. That's what we do. So when we're looking here at, the, at this passage, Amos tells us, don't look forward to this thing that's going to happen. God has already flooded the land. It's up to us to accept justice and righteousness and to make it happen in our world. That's our job. When we are able to have justice and righteousness flow through the land, then God will appreciate, will accept, will join us in the worship that we are giving. You know, back in the day, there were all kinds of things happening, and when he talks about, I hate your songs, I hate your sacrifices, this is, this is all just junk or bull. That's what, that's what they were, what Amos is saying is it's important that you not focus on these rules. You not focus on these things because you're not coming to me in the right attitude. You're not coming to me thinking about other people. You're not coming to me thinking about how you can help those who are in need. You're not coming to me to think about, to, to deal with the way that we, we work with one another in fairness and justice. And if you can't do that, it's just stuff. I mean, the song that's not felt in the heart the worship that is not given in love is not really worship. Soon we'll have a council meeting. I love council meetings. That's an unusual thing to say sometimes. But council, if you think about it, is the point at which the church gets to say, this is what we believe in, this is what matters to us, this is what we expect to do in God's realm over the next year or two years or, or however long it's going to be. It's an opportunity to reset, it's an opportunity to dream, it's an opportunity to vision and think about what is coming. Where are we going? If we want 
healing waters to flow over the land, we have to open the dam. We have to open the dam, and that starts right here. Opening our hearts, opening our doors, making everything all about God's vision for the world, not ours. I know what my sense of justice is, and it's nothing like God's. I have to check that at the door. People do things that makes me angry. Well, my sense of justice is revenge. Maybe I'm wired that way. Maybe many of us are. But that's not what God's justice is. God's justice is grace. And that's entirely different than the kind of justice we apply normally as a society. I, the Lord, hate and despise your religious celebrations and your times of worship. I won't accept your offerings or animal sacrifices, not even your very best. You know what? The commentators tell me, because I don't read Greek, the commentators tell me that that section is using language that is really focused on the rituals, the rules that the priests make, and how they share absolution with people. We need to be thinking about not what the rules are, but what God's vision for the way we live really is supposed to be. I ask you, as a church, as a people, as individuals, to take time to think about what is God wanting our world to be like? Have we reached that point? I think we can all agree that we have not. How do we get there and what is the role that we play in making God's vision happen? A healing river? Come and bring peace to our land. Amen.